Hey, how's everyone doing? Today we're going to be looking at this animated video that is going to teach us a bit about how a biogenesis didn't actually happen and how other people are lying or stretching the truth in order to get the audience to believe that a biogenesis did happen. Okay, let's have a look, shall we? I'm going to be cutting out quite a bit from the original video because I'm not particularly interested in sitting through a bad sense of humor, but feel free to watch the original video in the link in the description. It's easy to say things that aren't true and get people to believe them, especially when they sound sciencey and are mixed in with well-known facts. <laughs> well-known facts, I mean, that's what truth is based on, right? It's mixed in with well-known facts, which builds a foundation on new things that we discover. And yes, before we start this video, I do want to point out that whenever a creationist makes a video like this, it's just cherry-picking. You don't like abiogenesis, so you're going to denounce it as false. Meanwhile, you use your smartphone, your computer, you take your medication, you see a dentist. All all of these things are created from the same scientific method that brought us things like evolution and abiogenesis. They use the exact same process because that's just what science is. Everything it discovers needs to go through the rugosity that is the scientific method. Nothing is safe. On that note, let's take a look at some popular science videos on the origin of life and point out a few things they claim that are not exactly true. The first sort of made up thing you should be on the lookout for is what we call imagination story time land. Let's start with these videos from Be Smart and Stated Clearly. When discussing the origin of life, they use words like These molecules must have copied and made more of themselves. These building blocks combine to form highly complex and orderly structures like genes, proteins, and cell membranes. Unfortunately, the RNA-only world went extinct more than 3 billion years ago. See how they slipped into the past tense as if these things are proven? If you see words like, this must have happened, or people casually slipping into the passive voice or past tense, you can be pretty confident that it's story time. People only say something must have happened if they're really not sure that it happened, but want to act like they're sure that it did happen. Right, okay, so essentially you're arguing semantics here. I don't disagree with the language used, because according to what we know about biochemistry and what we know about early earth conditions, it's a logical conclusion to use standard past tense or the word must when describing these processes. If I walk into a crime scene and see someone bleeding from their abdomen with a knife in it, that person quote, must have been stabbed. I wasn't there to witness it, but the conclusion the conclusion is logical because we can see the aftermath of it. The same idea applies to abiogenesis, but of course must doesn't necessarily mean it did happen, but if you use it in this context from a person's perspective, then what it really means is that it's being used to map out a logical conclusion. You're interpreting the language incorrectly here, but just using past tense sure does seem like it gives quite a great degree of confidence, but at the end of the day you're just arguing semantics, since you can also interpret it as a logical conclusion, just like must, following certain statements like it was hypothesized, it is predicted or the evidence leads to, that's just the English language. Your video would be better if you actually gave arguments against the conclusion made by the science rather than complain about the language used in this video. The next place we'll go on our tour of science videos is half truth land Technically true, but also misleading. Miller's experiment took some simple chemicals like those found on early Earth. Did you catch it? Like those found on early Earth. They used simple chemicals like those found on early Earth. He knows that they didn't use chemicals actually thought to be on a prebiotic earth, but they were like them. Chemicals are chemicals after all, right? What are you even talking about? The word like here is meant to mean such as. Miller's experiment took some simple chemicals such as those found on early earth. You could even swap it with including. Like in this context doesn't mean that the chemicals are sort of similar to those found on early earth. It's an inclusive usage. Of course, Miller tried to simulate early earth based on what scientists thought at the time. We now know that the atmosphere was a bit different than what Miller had imagined. That being said, it doesn't mean the chemicals were necessarily incorrect, but rather that the proportions might have been slightly inaccurate. For example, Miller thought there were more reducing agents in the atmosphere, such as methane, water vapor, hydrogen, etc. But we now know later on that there was a lower quantity of those. In other words, these molecules weren't wrong, but Miller's experiment wasn't necessarily accurate on how much there were. In addition, Miller's experiment also featured less various other molecules that actually would have helped in the formation of amino acids, such as sulfur dioxide. Basically, Miller's experiment isn't used as a reference today to show exactly what happened on early Earth, but rather it's used as a proof of concept that amino acids, one of the building blocks of life, can indeed arise independently. So after this experiment was conducted, scientists have done other follow-up experiments that do match early Earth's atmosphere better.
better and have produced a variety of different things from even richer pools of amino acids to various nitrates, alcohols, aldehydes, and varieties of acids. That's the great thing about science, right? No hypothesis can be proven by just one experiment alone. A combination of peer reviewing and follow-up experiments must also corroborate. It's easy to pick on the Miller-Urey experiment and think it's really the only one that matters, but you actually have to go through dozens and hundreds of other papers to really get a grand picture of where we currently stand. Anyway, I got very off topic here. Let's move on. Like those found on early Earth, bubbled them up through a tube, zapped them with electricity, and after a few days floating in this soup, he found amino acids, the building blocks of proteins and one of the essential ingredients for life. That's true, but the rest of the story is that they mostly ended up with garbage. Any trace amounts of useful material would have been lost in a sea of toxic byproducts and tar. But why does that matter? The experiment was a proof of concept. It wasn't there to showcase the exact process of abiogenesis, but rather to show the concept that building blocks of life can indeed come about by itself through natural means. If we really wanted to show exactly how abiogenesis happened, we would do a one-to-one -one creation of early Earth, then give it a billion years. But obviously we can't do that, so we conduct individual experiments that showcase each individual step. Miller's experiment didn't even show us exactly how amino acids formed, just that it can, and then the experiment was used as inspiration for other scientific experimentation to take place, which built further upon our understanding of abiogenesis. Plus, even if other things were created in the process, things you call junk, unless you can show that it actively interfered with the formation of life or any building blocks of life, then your argument is pointless. But actually, we have had that once in other experiments, where the formation of nitrites could destroy amino acids. That was a concern for a bit until it was shown that amino acids could thrive easily. So similar to the nitrates, if you can show why this tar interfered with the formation of life's building blocks, it doesn't actually matter and is therefore irrelevant to the topic at hand. Researchers have recently discovered that many of the building blocks of life, amino acids and sugars, exist inside of meteorites. This tells us that these special molecules are being produced spontaneously all throughout our solar system. The half of the story that's true is that we have found some building blocks in meteorites. The other half of the story they don't disclose is that, much like the Miller-Urey experiment, these building blocks and letters are utterly unusable because they're mixed in with millions of other molecules that we don't want and are even toxic to life. Okay, first of all, you have yet to provide a concrete example of something else that hinders the formation of life. Second, this is again a proof of concept. It suggests the idea that, that amino acids form relatively commonly throughout the solar system, indicating that at least amino acids can be created spontaneously. Even if there are other junk in the meteorite, it could have simply been contaminated along the way, somewhere else, independent of the process of the amino acids formation. Look, if you want to try to debunk this point, feel free to, but you need a better understanding on how scientists think before jumping to your own conclusions. What made Miller's experiment so special was it gave us proof regular non-life stuff could become cool life stuff super easily. If you understood him to mean that non-living things can easily be turned into living things and that abiogenesis is super easy, you could be forgiven for misunderstanding this misleading half-truth. Actually, no. No one would think that. I mean, it was pretty clear that what was said was non-life stuff becomes life stuff. Life stuff meaning life's building blocks, not living things, which indicates life. Those are very different. I certainly didn't misunderstand it when I first watched it for the first time. Was it just you? I think it was just you. Half-truths are one thing, but let's go deeper now, beyond half truth land In order to find claims that are so exaggerated, so far removed from reality, we need to venture into outright falsehood jungle. Scientists have constructed ribozymes that can copy themselves, just like DNA gets copied. No reference is provided because this flat out isn't true. Hmm? What are you talking about? A reference was provided. Multiple references, actually. One of the cited papers, titled The Origins of the RNA World, talks about the creation of ribozymes in laboratories. And the paper itself actually cites multiple other experiments that have done just that. I'm not really sure what you're trying to gain by lying to your audience, something that you yourself criticized in this exact video, but whatever. Hypocrites be hypocrites. By the way, The Origins of the RNA World is a great read and goes into detail on many other things such as how the creation of ribozymes could come about through early Earth, I recommend giving a read if you're bored. There have been lots of experiments that make misleading claims, but actually reading the papers shows that they steal things from life and don't actually end up with anything self-replicating. Okay, so now you're just flat out lying again. You probably thought, oh, if I just put a bunch of scientific sources on the screen, people will be too lazy to actually check them so I can just lie about whatever I want. 
Well, guess what? I'm that idiot that wastes his time fact-checking creationists on the internet and exposing them for who they truly are. And I literally just started on the first paper you had on screen before already being able to debunk you. Let's have a look at the relevant part of the paper, shall we? Biochemical techniques were used to engineer ribozyme that copies RNA strands by adding letters not one by one, but three by three. Using three-letter triplet building blocks, this new ribozyme can copy various folded RNA strands, including the active part of its own sequence. Don't worry too much about the science here. Essentially, this paragraph talked about ribozymes copying in triplet instead of singles, and that gives it an advantage of some sort on being able to replicate RNA. Anyway, in another part, here we have examined whether substrates of such lanes can support RNA-catalyzed RNA replication by developing a ribozyme capable of iterative templated ligation of 5' triphosphorylated RNA trinucleotides, henceforth called triplets. This heterodymic triplet polymerase ribozyme demonstrated a striking capacity to copy a wide range of RNA sequences, including highly structured, previously intractable RNA templates, as well as its own catalytic domain and encoding template in segments. The paper itself is a very interesting read, but also relatively complex in how they developed their own idea on how the mechanism of an early ribozyme came about. But anyway, this doesn't necessarily mean this happened exactly one-to-one in early Earth. These are hypotheses after all, but it just goes to show that creationists can't be trusted with scientific sources. I would recommend everyone to read papers for themselves, but not everyone has the time to do so. Creationists utilize that fact to feed you wrong information all the time, so be wary. Having completely misrepresented the possibility of RNA self-replication, this Stated Clearly video goes on to make false claims about cell membranes and DNA replication. Some self-assemble into hollow spheres, almost identical, to, almost identical, to, almost identical to the membranes of modern living cells. This is outright false. The description is not even close, certainly not almost identical. Saying these hollow spheres are almost identical to real cell membranes is like saying a dinosaur-shaped chicken nugget is almost identical to a real T-Rex. No, we're talking about the formation of bilayers here. And although, yes, the cell has plenty of other things on or through their membranes, their base is still the same. There's still phospholipids formed together through the properties of hydrophilia and hydrophobia. The exact same thing would apply to any random phospholipid in the wild. They would form a bilayer because that formation satisfies the laws of entropy. So as long as we can figure out how phospholipids are formed, which we have by the way, then we know how cells get the base of their cell membranes. Of course, regarding other complexities of the membrane, most of that likely came afterwards. But the phospholipids itself had its concept proven. It's not all or nothing like you think. Science has stages of progressions, especially for a topic as complex as abiogenesis. Anyway, there's still more to the video left, so I'll consider doing a part two. Thank you to Fireshard, Alan Morton, Ms. Fixit, and Rick Clan for their support on Patreon. If you enjoyed this content, consider subscribing, or I'll feed you to the wolves.